If you could just make your way back to the seats, thank you. Um, we're going to start the second half of our um, symposium, Reckoning and Reform. In the first half, we um, reckoned, as it were, with the scope of the abuse crisis. Now we want to focus on the push for reform in the Catholic Church for solutions. And we're again privileged and honored to have a man who's been at the center of this issue for many years, and of course, never more so than in the past year. Father Hans Zollner is the president of the Center for Child Protection at the Gregorian University in Rome. It's a post he's held since 2010, and he has overseen tremendous growth in that center's work, a center that focuses on educating laity and clergy around the world on safeguarding practices. He's done this with precious few resources, little staff, even as the demand for his services and the work of the center has grown exponentially. I take this moment just to commend to you the Gre Gregorian Foundation, which supports the work of the Gregorian University and Father Zollner and his center. If you want to do something to make a difference in this battle for reform, and I know so many people feel so helpless. If you want to do something to make a difference for protecting children, you can do no better than supporting the Gregorian Foundation, which has helped us in bringing Father Zollner here from Rome. Father Zollner, uh, a German Jesuit, or I think as he would stipulate a Bavarian Jesuit. <clears throat> I guess they have issues like we do is in addition to his work at the Gregorian, a member of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors and a consultor to the Vatican's Congregation for Clergy. He holds a doctorate in theology and is a licensed psychologist and psychotherapist, and he was a chief organizer of the recent Vatican Summit on the Protection of Minors in the Church held at the Vatican between February 21st and 24th. Father Zollner travels uh, extensively. He has an incredibly busy schedule as he pursues his mission. And we're grateful to have him here to share his thoughts on that recent summit, on his work, and on what the church needs to do and where we need to go in the future. Following his talk, we'll again have a discussion, a moderated discussion, this time with Kerry Robinson of the National Leadership Roundtable and we will field some of your questions uh, a little more intentionally this time. As Father Zollner is speaking, please again write legibly and succinctly on the index cards. If we can't read them, we can't ask them. And we'll be sure to pass them down to the end of each row. And we and our student assistants will collect them. And I'll screen them and hand them to Carrie to ask to contribute to the discussion with Father Zollner. Father Hans, over to you. Good evening. Good evening. It is deeply consoling that uh, heads of university centers learn fast. Uh, so David has, has learned from yesterday today that uh, uh, I'm not a German, I'm a Bavarian. So. <laughs> So we, um, we have some 40 minutes or so uh, for um, my presentation, and then we will engage in a conversation. Um, as you can imagine, I would uh, be able to talk a lot about this uh, issue, and there is a lot to be said, but um, not only because of the limitations um, th that we all of us have, but also because of... Um, the necessity to focus on the most important things. Uh, I would hope that we can uh, have some time later also for exchange and discussion. My presentation follows this very interesting um, piece of research that uh, uh, my colleagues from John Jay have presented uh, so uh, convincingly. And um, I, I'm really glad that I can build on, on that presentation that shows the situation in this country, in my country, Germany, in uh, Poland, uh, and in other parts of the world. Um, we talk about new horizons, right? New horizons means 
that um, something has changed. And when I, I'm following news from the US uh, and from other parts of the world, the situation has changed over the last 14 months dramatically with regard to <clears throat> this issue. And I'm very well aware that, especially in this country, also in Germany, I can say, um, the situation has grown uh, really difficult for the institutional church because people are not only deeply worried, uh, deeply disgusted, disappointed about the misbehavior of priests or other clergy who have abused, but there is this new element um, that has come about, especially over the last 14 months, I believe, um, that brings about a sense of betrayal and uh, concerns regarding leadership who has not abused, but was negligent in dealing with abuse <clears throat> and has covered up uh, more or less actively and has obfuscated information. And when I follow news from Catholic sources and uh, debates uh, and the usual Twitter wars that are going on uh, in the blogosphere and in other areas, I, I get the sense that um, many people, and I would say to some extent the Catholic Church in this country, um, is in some state of what St. Ignatius, <coughs> our founder, uh, has called spiritual desolation. And uh, with spiritual desolation, St. Ignatius describes in the rules for discernment of spirits in the exercises, the state of the soul in which uh, there is a decrease in faith, hope, and love. And there is a decrease uh, in uh, trust, and there is a decrease in orientation. Um, and I feel, uh, forgive me if I am so blunt uh, here, I feel that much of the anger, much of the anguish, much of the depression, much of the um, deep disappointment uh, that many of us feel um, remains there and is brooding there, and is um, sort of self-enforcing with every new news about another allegation, another cover-up, another bishop, another grand jury report, another, and so forth. It is looming there, and uh, I, I feel, my perception is that it is not really getting out of that state of uh, the soul, of that mood and does not produce much in terms of proactively using that energy for something different. Because I think all of us, uh, very interesting point made by, by the, the two uh, colleagues from, uh, from John Jay before, we are much more formed also by, our, by the context and the, the mindset with which we have grown up and in which we are. So one of my main points is that um, we are at the breaking point in church history and, and the, the symptom that we see, the symptom of a disease and the symptom of this huge crisis um, is a symptom of something deeper. Uh, uh, and that has to do with the relationship of faith and um, belief versus our relationship to the world. And that translates to where do we find God today as Christians in this world, in a changed world, completely different communication world to 15 years ago. Economy completely changed. Political systems destroyed and changing. Um, and we carry on with our Christian responses, liberals and 
conservatives the same as if we had no idea what God is asking us um, uh, in this very moment. And this is not a new situation, uh, but the words that we read this morning in the, in the readings in, uh, during Mass may, uh, may resound um, in us as uh, the invitation to rethink uh, where we are, who we are as church, as faithful, as lay leaders, as deacons, priests, bishops, as church in our mission. In the book of Daniel, reading of today, it says, Azaria stood in the heart of the fire and he began to, in the heart of the fire, and he began to pray, oh, do not abandon us forever for the sake of your name. Do not repudiate your covenant. Do not withdraw your favor from us. For the sake of Abraham, your friend, of Isaac, your servant, and of Israel, your holy one. Lord, now we are the least of all the nations. Now we are despised throughout the world. Today, because of our sins, we have at this time no leader, no prophet, no prince, no place where we can offer you the first fruits and win your favor, no holocaust, no sacrifice, no oblation, no incense. But may the contrite soul, the humbled spirit, be as acceptable to you as holocausts of rams and bullocks. Such let our sacrifice be to you today, and may it be your will that we follow you wholeheartedly since those who put their trust in you will not be disappointed. Do not disappoint us. Did you find, did you hear ever a prayer in all the years that we are talking about this issue as strong as these words from 3,000 years ago? So, where we are, that is something that needs to bring about change. But change rooted in our experience, truthful to our present state in which we are, because this is the point of departure for everything, truthful to our search for God and for the possibility to look out for something new. Because this is obviously... Uh, something, a situation that uh, we, we need to face and not hide neither in denial nor in depression and anger. And this situation is new for, uh, <coughs> first and foremost because of one element that was also uh, mentioned in the presentation before. For the first time in the church language, in the church documents, in the church awareness, we talk about systemic elements openly. And who was it who put it on the agenda? The Pope himself. Starting with uh, his mistake, his grievous mistake, as he himself called it, in Chile in, uh, at the end of, of January, calling allegations against one priest, slander, and then retracting that, sending Monsignor Shikluna in to in investigate the cases. Uh, after having read through the 2,500 cases with 70 testimonies of victims, he sends a letter to the Chilean Bishops' Conference and says, I ask you, my brothers, I ask you, to look into the <clears throat> ramifications and the co-responsibility of the whole Chilean church. Why could it last so long, the abuse, and why could it be covered up for so long? Number one. Number two, the grand jury report 
and with due credit to all the uh, explanations of, of its enormous limitations and faults. But taking only this point speaks eloquently about the continuous cover-up uh, of uh, cases of abuse by numerous bishops in the six dioceses over the last 70 years. Pope responds to that a report published on 14th of August with the letter to the people of God on 20th of August. And in this letter, there is one sentence that, that has changed my perspective and uh, uh, as to how we need to look at the, the whole issue and how we need to address it uh, also in the context of the whole church. This sentence is sexual abuse is always connected to abuse of conscience and abuse of power. So this is a sentence that had never been said by any high-ranking um, church official, let alone the pope himself. Second element where he put the institution uh, uh, on the table for evaluation. Third element in the address to the Curia, to the Roman offices, uh, just before Christmas, he again addresses phenomena like clericalism, like um, uh, inability to really face reality, and this as an institution, or in that case, the institution that is, uh, at least to some extent, responsible for the leadership of the universal church. Finally, the letter of Pope Francis on 2nd of January this year to the US bishops before they went for on retreat, to which he had kindly invited them. <laughs> Took a second, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> um, reminding them of two things. This is your responsibility. You have to, to really make sure that you understand the issue and you, you act on the issue consistently. Secondly, it is your common responsibility. He likes to talk about synodality as a model of um, common understanding and discussion and taking responsibility together. And it seems as if these were new words, right? Because we have become a, accustomed to the fact that bishops act as if they, they are alone in their diocese with regard to other leaders uh, and, and the faithful in that diocese, but also as if they were alone leaders of the Catholic Church, and there were no neighboring bishops, and there was no bishops' conference. So for me, 2018 was uh, a year of change, and uh, it is very important to realize that we are at another level of awareness. I connect this also to societal changes like the Me Too movement. And uh, the fact that finally the gods of sport, the gods of film, uh, were thro thrown down from their thrones. Uh, and the same happened with the cardinals. The untouchables have become touchable and are facing prison sentences. This was not... <laughs> the same two years ago. Remember? I'm here also to speak about the situation worldwide. And, and I am a representative of, uh, yes, a Western country, but a country that has been dealing with this issue for exactly nine years and two months. 
in Germany, the wave was set off, uh, the tsunami, in, uh, on 28th of January 2010. Yes, before there were news. Yes, we knew about Boston. But it didn't touch us. It was far away. The Atlantic is broad. Hmm? So, why only then? I can't, I can't explain it. Uh, but only then, in Germany, in Central Europe, this issue became uh, a real number one priority for media and for the faithful. Before that, it wasn't there. And I can tell you, I've been traveling to 60 countries over the last years on six continents. I can tell you that this is still the case in my estimate, about 75% of countries. It's not that there are no cases of abuse, and the bishops know, and the religious superiors know. It's not that they, they are not off and on re reported, but it is not a number one issue, neither in society nor in church. And this is something very difficult to convey to an audience like yours, who have been dealing, as we have learned, since 1985 with this, uh, 85, with this topic. And you are fed up, and you think, when is it over? What I say to the persons with whom I work is, this will not be over in our lifetime. At least in countries, where they, are, they have not yet started to talk about it. And believe me, this is the great majority of countries. Yes, they read news. Yes, they, they follow uh, uh, the development. But it is as if you are watching television. You know? It's out there. And that's um, particularly true uh, for um, some parts of the world where there, there, there are other uh, uh, <coughs> forms of sexual violence against children that are, um, that are destroying the future of children. Child labor, child soldiers, lack of education, no functioning health system, no functional safety on a state level. So, what I would like to say is that um, I have seen over the last, let me say, four to five years, and I have seen in the last um, two months, since the meeting of the presidents of the bishops' conferences and the religious superiors on child protection took place from 21 to 24 of February, a change in the awareness among the leaders of those churches that have not yet dealt with the issue. I would say, for me, the meeting in February was partly a success because it brought about some kind of unity for the whole church leadership that was present on this. It is an issue that needs urgently to be addressed. We, we should not, we shall not run away, and we have to work together because we understand that this is affecting the whole church. Now, if you ask me how, how much uh, that awareness has grown, I, I would say if the level was here, the general level of awareness and willingness to engage, it may be now here, <laughs> in the average. If we consider that the US and Ireland, and Australia, maybe Germany is already here, it looks like going back, conceded. But even those who have been here understood a little bit more about the necessity to bring the whole church on board, which is, I believe, the Holy Father's um, serious interest. I am disappointed about the, the final message by the Pope because it did not highlight what could have been said, also about his own attitude, also because um, I believe still 
the church doesn't um, communicate well. Um, or also what, what is going on very well, as we have heard. The numbers uh, have, have of new allegations are consistently low. They, they will always remain at that level because we won't do away with, with the evil. Um, but at least it works. But nobody uh, is easy um, to understand that and is fast to understand that. So how do we face this situation in which trust has been shattered for some destroyed? You cannot say, hello, I have done an, a revision of my, my guidelines. Now you can believe me and trust me again. Trust doesn't work like that. Trust is built up over time and needs to be verified. And especially with people who have been so deeply uh, disappointed, it is very difficult to rebuild trust. So trust can only be rebuilt with two elements. One, as consistent and sober continuing the work that we are doing in safeguarding as well as in uh, finding new ways of um, meeting and listening to survivors. Secondly, trust needs to be built also by engaging with the heart. What is so striking for me in your country, as for example also in Australia and nowadays also in Germany, is this. You have, together with a few other countries, the highest standard you can wish for in terms of church personnel trained, volunteers trained. You have enormous sums of compensation paid out. You have... Um, uh, a climate where uh, now uh, uh, abuse is reported much more easily than before. Highest standard, what you can have at the moment in the world. And still people are so angry and so disappointed. How come? The same is true for Australia. When I was in Australia over the last three years, three times, I'm amazed that, that people say, bishops, don't get it. And I was always wondering, what, what does that mean? Because I see on paper you see all is in place. They could not do more, possibly. And people who work in safeguarding or in professional standards are worn out because it's never enough. It's never enough. You can fill into the void as much work and as much money as you wish. It's never enough. And people suffer from safeguarding fatigue. They can't do anymore. When I hear journalists here saying, I, can, I can't stand it anymore. I, I want to write about something nice. So, what is it? What is lacking? I would say what is lacking is the communication of the heart. Because once you believe that a person says what uh, means what he says, and, and the heart is palpable, is in the words and in the deeds, then you trust that we are going forward. As long as you have the impression that we do what we need to do because we are obliged to do, because the press is after us, or the judges, or whatever, or snap, huh? so then, okay, you limit yourself to the minimum of personal engagement, which is much less than what you officially do and provide. So how, I think that that is one of the points for seminary formation, of course, and I'm happy that uh, Sister Katarina is here, and, and the Institute of Psychology at the Gregorian, where I, I teach since 16 years, is providing psych psychotherapeutic training for professionals in seminaries. So this is where I come from originally. Um, um, but this is also a question of 
not only the initial formation, but also the ongoing formation and the induction of bishops. You know what a bishop receives as help and support for when he starts his office, his ministry? You know what Rome offers for, for him? Ten days in Rome, where they are dragged from one office to the other, and they receive information that they probably don't need and don't, uh, won't, won't use, and they don't receive information that would be necessary and, and helpful. And that's it. And then you are bishop in your diocese, and you are alone. That is how it feels for many bishops. So, um, just as we are here, and, and one data that you, you, you mentioned about the abuse, the average age, in the German study, there was a, a, a previous publication um, that compared in a meta-study all the other reports that were out there. Of course, John Jay and Australia and so forth and so forth. So the average age of a clergy abuser, according to that data, is of 39 years, which is 15 years into priesthood, at least at that time, when, when they were ordained, like in the, they were ordained in the late 60s, 70s, 80s. 39 is 15 years into priesthood and is 15 years later than a sports trainer or a public school teacher or a family father abused for the first time in the average. What does that say? Again, it is not celibacy as such, but it is how celibacy is lived out over time. So <laughs> I was always ad advocating for screening uh, of candidates to priesthood and, 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 and so forth, a and a human formation piece. Of course, this is necessary. But of late, I have come to advocate also ongoing formation for priests. And especially, as we have seen also from the difference in the numbers of um, diocesan and religious priests, especially in the diocesan world. The situation worldwide has reached another level of awareness, but honestly, uh, be prepared uh, that we need to face many more grand jury reports from other parts of the states and many more such devastating reports from other countries. This has not yet started. What can help? I think first and foremost that we realize that we, we as we are here, we won't do it alone. We need outside help. We need expert advice. We need people who can uh, intervene and uh, counsel what is the next step. And that is very much contrary to our normal thinking. Because church thinking is outside people don't understand us. And, and therefore, we need to find our resources only within. This is, this is very harmful over the time that we have been acting like that. Because then it is an inbreed, and you know what happens with inbreed. At a certain point, uh, diseases develop. Uh, synodality is one of the key words for Pope Francis's um, theology and understanding of the church. What does it mean? It means that we come together as faithful, as clergy, as men and women, with all the competences and with all the um, expertise that we bring uh, with us, the experience, life experience. Synodality is a buzzword since Francis has started to use it. Um, 
it is not an easy task to live it out. Because synodality is the contrary to the authoritarian approach. I tell you, you do. This is exactly not what Francis is doing. He wants, maybe sometimes we don't understand very much how he goes about, but I think in, in the end he does push us to take more responsibility. Um, and I feel that there is sometimes uh, quite a pushback also from all quarters, from left and right, from laity and bishops, uh, because what does that mean? It means we need to discuss with each other. We cannot go on with our own mindset. Secondly, it means that we need to commit to something. If there is a process, then this process has to f be followed through. And I can't say, if they don't follow my idea, I go away. Thirdly, it means that um, you don't know what the result of the, the process is. And this makes many people, I believe, in the church very uneasy. On the left and on the right, for different reasons. But human beings tend to love what they have always known. And as it has always been in personal life and in institutions. So um, the inclusion of lay experts, lay voices, female and male, the inclusion of specific experts who can help us to understand this complex world better, the, the capacitating people in the pews will be a, a result of this transformational process. I'm deeply convinced about that. The church in 20 years, in maybe 50 years, will look very different to what we know now. Also because, tell me, what is a priest all about today? What is the core of priestly ministry? This is already very difficult to explain, at least to me, because I really ask you some questions about that. But then compare that, what priestly life is today for many in reality, which is so far away from that what is projected or taught or written about. And it has certainly nothing to do with what seminary training looks like today. <laughs> I was my, a seminarian of my home diocese, Regensburg, before I entered the Society of Jesus. So I know both worlds. Um, but the seminary life uh, was so, so cut off from reality, was such an island, such a fortress, that you uh, automatically, you, you are imbued with a sense of being different. Now, what is the difference of being a priest? Uh, wh what are, what are the, the core essential ministries of priesthood? And what is the core of episcopacy? Is it to be the manager of hospitals, of the treasurer of big property? W what is it? So w where did this evolve into? And when did it start? It didn't start 50 years ago. It started much earlier. So again, this is not easy for none of us because we, we don't know where this will lead to in two, in five, in 25 years. It's interesting to see that despite all the scandals, despite all the difficulties, um, so many people 
want the Catholic Church to live out what our Lord wanted it to be. Yesterday I met a survivor of abuse who lives in the city. We spoke one hour and the first sentence with which we, he welcomed me was, I'm enraged about this church. And he said, further, it was not the abuse that hurt me most. It was the response of the church authority to that that hurts most today. But I tell you what, I want this church, and he says he doesn't know whether he believes in God or not. Eh? So I want this church to be more modeled, closer to the ideal that Jesus Christ had of the community of believers, and that is the church. So, um, one element of this synodality that we have not yet started to think about, and this is also my, my constant nagging at the theologians among us, because there is no theology of abuse um, in the Catholic Church and in other religions. Hmm? But the other, the other element is, in the synodality piece, what is the position, what is the place of victims of abuse in our discernment processes, in our parishes, in our pastoral work, in our dioceses and religious houses and communities? Do we think about that, or is it they and us? These three words were the headlines for the three days of work at the, uh, during the meeting in February. First day, responsibility. Second day, accountability. Third day, transparency. Responsibility meant as spelling out to the bishops and the religious superiors who were there uh, what they have to do according to church norms and according to the church's indications about the collaboration with civil authorities. This is the personal responsibility, okay? Second day, accountability. To whom are you as a bishop accountable? To whom are you, religious superior, accountable to? And how is this defined today and how should it be defined in the future? So many people... Um, don't know that a bishop in the Catholic Church can only be judged canonically by one man in the world. And this is number one, the man in white. So this is true um, in all countries, in all contexts, in all situations. No president of a bishop's conference, no metropolitan archbishop effectively has any say about any other bishop. There's only one person who, who can intervene and can dismiss or sanction, and that is the Pope. Now, if you have 5,100 bishops in this world, in the Catholic Church, how could he possibly look after all of them? So, effectively, we need a change here. And a change was proposed by the American Bishops Conference in uh, end of October, and that was rejected to the great uh, astonishment and anger of many in this country and elsewhere, but it was rejected on the simple grounds that it went against current church law. Yes, the proposal went against church law, and you can imagine if you send in a, a law to the Senate that goes against the Constitution, what they do with that. They throw it out before it reaches there. 
um, precisely on the point that in that proposal was the idea that lay people would judge bishops. And that is not possible according to canon law today. Sorry about that, but this is the law. That does not mean that lay people could not be involved in review boards, in selection process of bishops. That does not mean that they are excluded. Rather, that they have the right position and the right place to give their input. In the end, it will always be, at, at least for the time we are around, it will always be the Pope who will have the last say. But uh, a, a model was proposed at the conference, at the meeting, by Cardinal Supic from Chicago, in which he um, mentioned the possibility that the archbishops, so what is called in church language the metropolitans, have a special role in the accountability of their uh, suffragan bishops, of those bishops that are included in that region and are simple bishops and would need to report to the archbishop. Right? This is another model, another way of decentralizing and um, allowing another level of um, first clearance, a clearinghouse, at least, if they <coughs> we talk about allegations of negligence, of cover-up, or obfuscation. Finally, transparency. Um, that was the day when we had Sister Veronica from Nigeria sitting there and, and calling the Pope Brother Francis and uh, calling her brother bishops from a uh, Africa um, to account. And that gave uh, an impression of uh, where we are moving towards because she was as frank as you could be on all these issues. But transparency was also called for by the Mexican uh, veteran um, uh, journalist, Vatican journalist uh, from Mexico, Valentina Alizraki, um, who was speaking in very strong terms to that effect. You, church, have a choice. Either you are transparent in your processes and in your data and in your collaboration with the general public, media, etc. And then there is a model of working together. Or we will be your enemies. <laughs> that um, came across uh, uh, very strongly. And some African and Asian bishops and Eastern European bishops uh, were quite surprised about that. Then, this has been highlighted before, sexual abuse of minors uh, is for, first and foremost a power issue. It has, of course, sexual expressions, sexual deviance if you talk about pedophilia, but as we have heard, this is a very minor part in the strict sense of the psychiatric de definition of pedophilia, an exclusive sexual interest in prepubescent children. That is 3.5% or 5%, whatever it is. It is very low. The bulk of all uh, sexual predators among clergy were and, and are uh, those who have been called generalists, who take the occasion who grab whoever they have at hand because of other needs to fill in the void of loneliness, to um, deal with personal issues of any kind, with needs for intimacy, uh, but almost exclusively there are also connected to the question of power. I feel powerful. And that is also a key to understand people who abuse 
minors or people in vulnerable situations. Um, because ultimately, in a psychological interpretation, they don't feel um, they don't feel strong enough. They don't have self-esteem. And therefore, they need to feel themselves powerful with people, in relation to people, who are younger or weaker. Um, we have already spoken about religious and priestly formation. We have, I don't need to add anything about homosexuality and celibacy because it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, and very convincingly. The data speak for themselves. If 30% of all Americans live a celibate life, point, pointing to priests as strange beings who, who live uh, uh, this um, impossible life, um, uh, needs to be questioned at least. Child protection and safeguarding uh, is the one task I, I think that we should um, commit to. The Catholic Church in, in the US has done so very convincingly, very consistently, at least on paper and with all the investment. But uh, what we don't have is um, this sense of bringing it to every single consideration making it a priority in all what we do, what we strive for, what we present. Keeping people, and especially the most vulnerable, who are the children of this world, keeping them safe. Not as an add-on, but as an inbuilt need, an inbuilt wish, an inbuilt commitment that comes from the heart and that speaks to the heart. Thank you. You're young and agile. Thank you very much, uh, Father Hans. And while um, Kerry Robinson uh, joins him on the on the dais, a couple of things. Please pass any of your car index cards to the end, and we'll collect those for some questions to ask. Um, Kerry will um, begin. Oh, yeah, let's. Um, hmm. Oh, uh, to the end of the, yeah, I just need to turn this off. Exits. Oops. Oh, there it goes again. Okay. Um, just to introduce Carrie briefly, she's the founding executive director of the uh, Leadership Roundtable, which, along with Father Zollner's center, may be one of the best kept secrets in the Catholic Church. The Leadership Roundtable is dedicated to promoting excellence and best practices in the management, finances, and re human resources, resource development of the Catholic Church. But the group was formed in the wake of the 2002 abuse crisis, and it's played an increasingly crucial role in pushing reform, advising the bishops in the Vatican by providing concrete proposals that start with the laity and other experts. And I really advise you to go to their website and check out some of the recent proposals that they've been formulating and promulgating. Carrie is a critical part of that effort, and she wears many hats. But we're really happy to have her here to lead this discussion with Father Hans. Carrie? Thank you. Well, first, Father Zollner, I hope you appreciate how sincerely so many of us value what you are doing at this moment in the church's history. Uh, I, in some ways, you are standing in the heart of the fire. And um, your attentiveness over six continents to 60 countries, placing survivors at the center of your care and their families is something that ennobles all of us. Uh, you are a great blessing and we're enormously grateful. So I would normally end with this question, but I'm going to begin because you are a Jesuit. 
given that you um, have been working uh, so intensely on something so urgent and so heartbreaking, uh, where and, and given that you have just come off of this seminal conference of um, presidents of bishops' conferences in Rome, can you tell us what your greatest desolation and your greatest consolation is right now in the work that you are doing? Yeah, I can say that um, um, the greatest desolation is that in some quarters of um, the church, there is um, uh, still some kind of not active um, resistance or fighting, but a passive one uh, in acknowledging the situation, acknowledging the hurt of victims, acknowledging the crimes of priests, acknowledging the necessity to clean up and less uh, resistance to do something for safeguard. Um, and I have to say that this is, you can explain that, for example, for example, the, the Central Eastern European countries are very much in that mood. And you can explain that with the history of communism and the influence of um, police and psychiatry and media in fighting the churches there. And almost all the bishops who are now in ministry in Poland and in Czech Republic and in Hungary have grown up under the communism. So reporting a priest who is abused for them is like handing over one's own son to the execution. So you can explain that, but still it is very disappointing and uh, uh, certainly um, challenging. The biggest um, consolation uh, are, okay, are two things. One is that I'm in contact, in constant contact with survivors of abuse who write to me, some of them on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to meet one on Friday in, uh, in Toronto. Um, no, on Thursday. Yeah. Um, um, and they, with all, with all the continuous news about abuse and cover-up that we face day after day, right? They, they say, Father, continue. And we pray for you that you continue. This is, a, this is a very strong consolation and motivation. And the other point is, um, having seen, having heard myself and through others, how bishops went away after the February meeting, those from Africa or those from, from Asia, and, and they said that they had understood something very in a very different way, and seeing that some of them, at least from whom I have news, coming back to their countries, they have started to move. Thank you. This next question has to do with the role of the laity. What can we do concretely to accelerate the intentional inclusion of lay leadership, expertise, competencies, decision-making, and co-responsibility at every level of the church, uh, even and especially in the Roman Curia, while we wait for canon law to be amended? And if you want to focus on women in this context, we will not hold that against you. <laughs> I did not expect that question from you. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do is um, you prepare yourself, you, uh, you make reasonable statements, recommendations, um, you do your professional work to the best of your capacities, 
and you will be called on. Um, this has happened to the two undersecretaries uh, with whom we have worked uh, together in the organizing committee. It is, it is true that uh, it was all four clerics, um, two cardinals, an archbishop and a simple priest. Um, but we had insisted that uh, there should be lay women and mothers uh, on this organizing committee. And in the final minute, we got Dr. Gambino and Dr. Ghisoni on the, on the committee uh, with this. They are the number threes, respectively, for the sections of life and of uh, family um, in the Congregation for Laity, Family and Life, headed by Cardinal Farrell. Brackets. It would not it would not have been without Cardinal Farrell that I mean you see that somebody who is sensitized and, and aware of this obvious um, um, need and, and whatever you call it, um, he brings about that, that change, but of course the Pope himself has um, has appointed uh, these two ladies. So there is much more possible than you think canon law allows for because canon law is very flexible. Um, the, Archdiocese of Munich, the Archdiocese of Munich has six sectors in the leadership of the Archdiocese, and three of those six sectors are headed by lay women. So um, th this is one of the things where creativity is called for and allowed for. You spoke of the abuse and misuse of power and rightly naming that at, at the center of what we are talking <coughs> about. Would it be advantageous to augment or supplement the John Jay study with a similar study on the abuse and misuse of power in the church? And with those findings, take a fresh look at how we select candidates for the episcopacy, how we place bishops, how we evaluate bishops and um, provide the ongoing formation and training. Okay, how, how, how you would do that um, would be an interesting question because power is everywhere. And as Foucault says, uh, a, a power cannot be extinguished. Power is always there. Either you have it or I have it, but it is there. So um, the, the question is how you educate people in understanding what power is, what they have as power, what is the counterpart is the responsibility and the accountability. Um, so of course, this is the, the next bigger issue that we have to look into is the uh, the use and abuse of power, and and I think that um, th that has certainly to do with the selection process for candidates to the seminary, to the novitiate, to the priesthood, to religious life, but not only, because uh, also lay leaders uh, would need to be held accountable for how they use their power, respectively, either by denying that power or uh, by exerting it in an in an inappropriate way, I tell you I tell you <laughs> one thing about um, one story from a country far away from here. Um, <laughs> so I was invited to to conduct a workshop for lay leaders in the church for a specific issue where there were also in the group, so it was 25 lay leaders, high ranking, high professional, highly renowned people in that society, well-known personalities. And, uh, and some bishops were present. And my goal in pre preparing the workshop was, we, after a day, we, we know what will be the next steps, how they are defined, and who is responsible for that from among the participants. And guess what? Some of those really highly qualified lay people rejected the idea that they would take on responsibility because they realized if they take it on, they may be charged 
with non-delivery, uh, non-compliance, they are at risk with that. So this is what I meant also when I, I spoke earlier about responsibility and accountability are nice if it concerns the others. But if I'm called uh, into uh, responsibility, yeah, <laughs> then that's another a pair of shoes, right? Um, I think we, uh, I think really, again, we are in a, in a phase of development where companies, big companies, turned away from authoritarian styles to cooperative leadership models. Yes, this is, I believe, this is at least to some extent what Pope Francis calls for when he call, uh, speaks about synodality. But this has also be, to be translated into every diocese, in every religious community, in every parish. Two days ago, I was in, uh, in Washington uh, at uh, Holy, Trinity, Tr Holy Trinity Parish, Georgetown, and I found, at least from outside, at least from the two hours that I was there and speaking with, that Bo, there, the, the lay leaders of the parish council and so forth, are very self-confident and, and, and communicate that very clearly, and they have their say, and they shape the parish life. Okay, this is from a member of the audience. What is the church doing uh, globally to alleviate the abuse of nuns, seminarians, and young priests? What, what she does, what the church does, uh, is um, that what, it, what <laughs> it can do in terms of... Um, uh, raising awareness about this and following the rules and the the sanctions and uh, the the canon law norms that are in place for that. I believe that when we deal with the issue of child sexual abuse in the way that we have been talking today, this has immediate repercussions and consequences for any kind of power issue, and this is also a power issue, um, male, female, if we t uh, talk about religious nuns abuse, um, seminarians, to, to some extent certainly also. Um, so the question is how, um, how, how do we present convincingly an ideal a and a, a perspective in which consistency in uh, one's own lifestyle um, is not something that you have to promise another time uh, or extra, be but because it is part and parcel of your conviction, of your discernment, and your decision, your life's decision. This question also from the audience, and you touched on it a bit in your remarks. Uh, were you satisfied with the February Vatican summit? And concretely, what did it do? And concretely, what did it fail to do? Yeah, I said that I was partly satisfied because I believe it achieved at least my major goal that I had before, raising awareness. And this is... Um, very concrete, if you look into the lives of people. And uh, I was also uh, amazed to see the congruence in the presentation before, when you were speaking about the long haul that changing culture needs uh, to succeed. I mean, this was also a quotation from the previous presentation. Um, uh, and I have to say that the belief that norms, new norms, stricter norms, other laws would automatically change the behavior of people uh, is, is uh, a, a fallacy. Um, you know that you have capital punishment in your country. Does it deter people to kill other people? No, it doesn't. Um, 
if you ha okay, you need that law, and I need I I'm I'm the the first one to say that we need different church law for dealing with abuse and, for example, defining specific punishment for different uh, categories of abuse, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, we need the definition of the rights of all parties in the, in, the, in the church trial, which we don't have at the moment. There is no definition of this, only general, vague, very vaguely, and that is why I say canon law is very flexible, because it, it, very often it is completely unspecific. Um, um, but what we need for the change of culture is the change of the attitude or, if you wish, the change of the heart. And, uh, and that is needed in a country in which you have everything in place, like in this country, where all the norms and all the legislations and all the obligations are in place. When I came here, I, I, I needed to produce a paper from my provincial that says that I'm in good standing and there are no allegations against me. Otherwise, I could not celebrate mass here, right? Um, so, just to say, yeah, the norm is there. But that, would that automatically determine to harm another person? No. That needs my own attitude and my own conviction, right? So, um, I think that we have gotten far, as far as you can get in three and a half days. I believe that. What, I, I, what it could have achieved much better, and I believe it will achieve uh, as a follow-up, are very concrete things. A few of them were already ready when we finished, but for one reason or another, they were not published. They were not promulgated. Among them, a law for the Vatican City State for reporting, a, a so-called vademecum, uh, a guideline for uh, bishops and religious superiors, how to deal in what case of allegation, a sort of jurisprudence, which we don't have until now. Um, the task forces that I have been advocating means um, the deployment of groups of three or four to different parts of the world where we don't have guidelines yet. Um, and we help the bishops' conferences to develop them and to implement them. Mm. So I believe this will be there in, I don't know, two weeks, the first, and two months, the second, and maybe uh, five months or, or eight, the last one. But th there will be... Um, there, there, there will be a, a follow-up and there will be concrete measures and, and there are enough people who are pushing for that. You had mentioned, I think, 5,100 bishops as direct reports to Pope Francis, which from a business standpoint is completely untenable managerially, given the other <laughs> responsibilities he has. So it seems as though canon law is being held up as the reason not to attend to that challenge. So what is it, or, or how could canon law be changed so that we don't place Pope Francis or his successor in that untenable position? No, th this is what we have been talking about um, with regard to um, accountability. So there are other models there. Now, I, I have much sympathy for the accountability to the metropolitan, Cardinal Supic's model. But be aware that this is not only about canon law. This is about theology. And this, ladies and gentlemen, goes to some extent against Vatican Council II theology. Why? Because Vatican Council II theology put the bishop in the privileged place, the single bishop, and did not evolve and really establish a system of functioning, not even collegiality, let alone synodality. So, and this is something 
that goes back to a model of the church of the first centuries, where the metropolitan was, uh, had an influential uh, role. Uh, when we talk about uh, bishops' conferences, these are very recent developments, in church history at least, maybe 100, 150 years or so. Uh, with the metropolitan model, we go back maybe 1,500 years or, or longer. So, um, but, but again, this would mean changing our theology, and this sits here, and changing our ways of relating to other people, and that is something deeply entrenched in us. To change that is hard work. Uh, do we have time for one more? Okay. Okay. Um, you know from our own work uh, over these years that Leadership Roundtable views what we are currently experiencing as twin crises, the crisis of sexual abuse of children and vulnerable adults and the crisis of distrust of leadership. And attending to one without the other, we would posit, is, is folly. Uh, your analysis uh, places survivors at the center of our deliberations and any plan of action moving forward f uh, in terms of recovery and reform is, is entirely appropriate and just and one of the, the reasons we are particularly glad to work with you. On the reform side of it, there is a call for a task force or kind of an architecture for action with immediate, mid, and long-term concrete actions. Uh, you, you have called, or the Vatican meeting uh, suggested setting up such a task force, perhaps even by continent. Can you say a little bit more about that and how, again, uh, committed laity can exercise our baptismal responsibility to be part of these reform efforts in a concrete way. Now, my understanding of the task forces would be that, uh, as I said, at least one per continent with three or four people, one can a lawyer, one a psychologist, and one theologian, plus a clerk taking notes and writing reports, and so go into one country and prioritizing those who are in bigger need, uh, say, they don't have guidelines or they have insufficient guidelines or for whatever reason um, the implementation doesn't work, they t t talk to the stakeholders, they produce a report in which they propose next steps, they send the report to the bishops' conference, to the uh, respective offices in Rome, and uh, they propose... Um, um, how the implementation could work out. Now, among those experts, of course, uh, I, I see lay people um, and many lay people involved uh, in all those capacities. So, um, and I have a few names that I would propose for that because um, um, there are many very qualified people you would need to call on people who know the culture, who, who speak languages. Um, mm. And uh, the Catholic Church has 1.3 billion members, and uh, there, there, there is enough man and woman power uh, to, to supply to all kinds of special tasks. Well, thank you again, Father Zollner, for your work, for your ministry. Re know that you can rely on our prayers and our advocacy. Would you please join me in thanking Father? Thank you, Carrie, very much for, for moderating this discussion. And thanks again, Father Hans, to all our participants, Karen Terry and Maggie Smith. Thank you all for being here. This is not the end of our programming on the crisis. Um, nor is it the end of the reform of the church. It will continue, and I hope you'll continue to support the CRC, but above all, the work of Father Hans and the Gregorian Foundation and the Leadership Roundtable. Thank you all very much.